pleasure to see everyone here today and to introduce uh, Louise, Louise uh, Hucky Myers, who's a staff scientist in my team. Um, she joined actually exactly four years ago, uh, just uh, her anniversary was this weekend, um, uh, as part of uh, Andrew Jaffe's uh, data science uh, team. And I was initially tasked with helping train Louise. Um, back in um, 2021, uh, summer 2021, Louise already gave a Libre seminar back then. Not everyone here in the audience was, was part of the Libre Institute, um, but that seminar was about some of the initial work we were doing on answering the question, what the convolution method, computational convolution method can you use uh, for estimating cell type fractions on bulk rna data? As you are probably aware, we have over 5,000 bulk rna samples in the Institute. And so a lot of you have different projects involving the convolution. Um, and um, Louise, Louise's answers or partial answers back then influenced a lot of projects in the Institute. So um, this is like closing the loop of that uh, in collaboration with uh, Kristen Maynard, Stephanie Higgs, and, uh, and other people. So this uh, is our best answer so far. Um, and I hope you, you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leo. Hi, everybody. Um, as Leo mentioned, I'm Louise Hugh Myers. I work in a data science here at um, And today I'm going to be presenting on our work with benchmarking convolution methods in the human brain. Um, so, very general overview. As you all may know, at Libre, we study a lot gene expression in the human brain. And when we, we understand the function of different cell types and uh, structures in the brain is to study um, their transcriptional profiles. Um, so over the past few years, there's a rapidly evolving landscape of methods and assays we can use to study gene expression in the brain. Um, and so with this Lego brain, we're kind of uh, representing the evolution from bulk RNA-seq where we're finding we're studying the gene expression of a mixture of different cell types versus uh, single nucleus RNA-seq, which is the evolution of that where we're able to find the transcriptional profiles of individual populations of different cell types. So why is that important? Um, we know that the brain is a very complex tissue and it's made up of com complex cell types that have very different translational properties because they have very different functions within the brain. Um, so uh, for example, a big split between our glial cell types, our supporting cell types, and our neurons. Um, and we also know that some diagnoses are associated with specific cell types, such as pip hopkins syndrome, which is associated with oligodendrocytes. So knowing more about these cell types is important for our overall goal of knowing more about neuropsychiatric disorders. So how do we connect bulk RNA-seq, which is our more abundant um, data type, with this more fine-grained, fine-resolution single nucleus RNA-seq? Um, and then like to note that the bulk RNA-seq is much more abundant for, uh, as it requires much more resources. The single nu nucleus RNA-seq is much more expensive to produce and we have much fewer sample sizes. So one way we can kind of connect these two different data types and learn more about the, the cell types that make up our bulk RNA-seq samples is through a process called deconvolution. A computational method that uses single cell, single nucleus RNA-seq and cell type profile, cell type gene expression profiles to infer cell type proportions from both bulk RNA-seq um, gene expression. So we take our bulk RNA-seq um, gene expression and basically we try to regress out our cell type proportions using our single nucleus RNA-seq as a guide for what cell types and what those uh, gene profiles may look like. Um, so why is deconvolution important in bulk RNA-seq analysis? So we know that the brain tissue is heterogeneous. We know it's made up of these complex and different cell types. We also know that samples within a study can differ in cell type composition due to either biology, such as case control, um, or maybe like for a technical variation, such as dissection. So an example of that that we dealt with was recently in our Habenula data set, where the Habenula can be quite difficult to dissect from the thalamus, and we're able to use deconvolution to check the proportion of habenula we had in each of our samples to better QC and um, analyze those samples. Um, and on that note, we can use data like that to control for cell fractions between samples to either make our case control cleaner, do quality control, and try to like reduce that as a confounding factor in our case, case control analyses, um, preventing false positives and false negatives 
and down, downstream analyses. So how do we run deconvolution? So once again, kind of the three pieces of the puzzle you need are your gene expression, bulk RNA-seq bulk RNA -seq samples. So you probably already have that in an experiment. You need a gene expression single cell type, um, you need a single cell, uh, a reference data set, hopefully from the same frame region and like a close, as close match as possible. And then you need a deconvolution method. So which method should you choose? Um, so we know that there's over 20, 20 different single cell reference based deconvolution, deconvolution methods bouncing around out there. Some are more popular than others. You might have heard of some such as CyberSort. Um, we've talked about this music, DWLS before, but there's a lot of different methods to choose from. And then if you go and you dig through the literature, you might find some, some different answers as to which is the best. Um, so basically this, this quote from this COVID's benchmark, benchmarking shows different methods perform best on different data sets, can leave you with some questions. Um, also, if you read through different papers that perform benchmarks on what we consider real data, not pseudobulk data, um, different methods come up as the top. I'm gonna to point out these last three. So in that COVID's benchmark, to DWLS ranked as the best from the Gen L benchmark, CyberSort and Music were the top methods. Um, from the Diet L, a method called Detangle, and also BISC were the best. Um, so, yeah, I love just shrugging, reading our uh, reading through the literature. So everybody else's previous benchmarks kind of left us wondering. So what we decided to do was to do a benchmark on deconvolution methods. So the goal of our overall benchmark was to first build a multi-assay data set with orthogonal cell type measurements that'll help us better answer this question. Um, and then we're going to test some top deconvolution methods that employ different strategies on that data set. And then to finally assess the, and then also assess the impact of other factors on deconvolution, such as um, different types of bulk RNA-seq, also um, different features in your single nucleus RNA-seq input and also the effect of select, selecting marker genes. So the six methods we selected out of those 20 plus um, were the ones listed here. And the ones we selected were like popular, often cited. And we also tried to pick our other top results from benchmarks. And also we tried to pick methods with a diverse approaches. So the six we chose were DWLS, which relies on weighted least squares, BISC, which performs assay or bias correction in the assay or between the two assays. Music, which tries to does bias correction in this reference data set. Bayes prism, which relies on a Bayesian method. HSPE, which is an evolution of the detangle method, um, not relies on high color collinearity adjustment. And then CyberSort X, which uses machine learning. Uh, and most of these are our packages with the exception of CyberSort primarily being a web tool. Uh, so our, like, to answer, how are we going to build on all of those previous benchmarks? Like, what are we going to do differently here? Um, so previously, previously, a lot of other benchmarks use suitable data to try to, um, like, have a real a answer of real cell type proportions. So basically taking a single cell data set, picking a, either, like, combining them by the found proportions or simulating different proportions, using that as the bulk. So then you have a known proportion and deconvoluting that and then comparing it with the known input. But we're suspicious that that might not really reflect the real, what real bulk looks like. Um, so we're not like super fond of this method. Um, other methods have also compared with immunofluorescence data um, and like counted up cell types uh, through that method or also through cell flow sorting, which is really popular for studies that use human blood. However, cell flow sorting is really difficult in human brain as it's frozen tissue, so we can only really access the nuclei, and it's much more difficult to label and accurately sort those. So this is a more challenging method for brain. So rather, our strategy was to use a paired orthogonal imaging data set to measure our cell type proportions and then use those to evaluate method accuracy. And also, we're specifically focused on just the brain, brain tissue and not worried about other tissue types. So I guess, um, so what is this orthogonal data? So the idea is that we want to measure the same thing here being cell type proportions using two different methods that don't interact. So they're not uh, like skewed by each other. Um, 
And those multiple independent, independent measurements help us build confidence that that's like really what's happening in the tissue. Um, so in other methods, this me or other benchmarks, sometimes people call this like the gold standard, um, we kind of shy away from using that term because we know lots of methods have their own, own biases and issues. So we're gonna use orthogonal data as our uh, point out here. So in our study, we're trying to estimate cell type proportions and we're gonna do that through deconvolution and we're also gonna do that through RNA scope, immunofluorescence, so using imaging data, counting up individual cells. And then through both of those, we're gonna estimate cell type proportions and then compare them together. Um, so it, it, illustrated by this little scatter plot here. Um, so first I wanna introduce the very cool multimodal data set that we um, created from the human DLPFC. Um, so this is kind of an evolution of this, the same data set that we used in the spatial DLPFC project. So in the spatial DLPFC project, we had 30 visium slices from 20 or from 19 donors paired with or 10 donors. It's like 19 brain blocks. So we have um, uh, we have our visium slices paired with single nucleus RNA seq slices in like consecutive tissue blocks. So it's as close to the same piece of DLPFC as possible. Um, so and we were able to analyze those together, knowing that that's very, very similar tissue that we were looking at. Um, so this was great work um, on the bench done by Kelsey. Um, so from there, we have our single nucleus data. Uh, but then expanding upon that, we added two other assays in this data set. So we have our RNA scope data. Um, so uh, here, this purple slice. Then that single nucleus is this blue slice. And then below it, these pink and brown slices became bulk RNA-seq data. Um, and then to show we have two different RNA scope combinations, which I will get into in a bit. Um, and then we have our single nucleus data and then bulk RNA-seq, we have six different varieties of, which again, I'll talk about in a second, but just to break down this chart. Um, so this is one single tissue block would be like a column and everything that we have in blue is where we have like an actual sample paired. So for most of these, we have like a nice complete data set. We lost a few things due to like QC and other technical issues, but we have this very cool data set where we have um, like um, different assays in multiple samples for some assays from like very, very close together pieces of tissue. Um, so the first data set is our single nucleus RNA-seq reference. Um, so this is 10 donors, 19 slides. This was also previously published in the spatial DLPFC paper. Um, and here we're going to study it at the resolution of our seven broad cell types. So it's astrocytes, endothelial mural cells, microglia, oligodendrocytes, oligodendrocytes precursor cells or OPCs, and then excitatory and inhibitory neurons. We know that there's more subtypes here, but we're focusing at this broad level in this paper. And then we have the compositional breakdown of that overall data set where our neurons are our more, more common cell types. Um, so overall, this is a data set of 56,000 nuclei. So we're gonna be using this as our single nucleus reference. And then for our bulk RNA-seq, we have 110 samples, and this comes from six different library type and RNA extraction combinations. So we have data from both poly-A and Rebozero gold library types. And then we also chose, we also did three different RNA extractions for these. So we have the full cell or total, but we also did the cytoplasmic only RNA and the nuclear only RNA. And then comparing the gene expression profiles of just these like uh, different preparations of bulk RNA, we're able to see big, big changes in gene expression. Um, maybe not expression, but uh, gene measurement. Uh, so from our principal components of the gene expression, it's split really cleanly on PC1 between our poly-A samples and purple here on the, on the left, and our um, RNA0 and the gold on the right. And then if you look at PC2, we can also see it divide out by our RNA extractions, so cytoplasmic, total and nuclear. So we kind of like, you can see that there's big differences here. And a reason that we ran so many different types of bulk RNA-seq is that we were curious about how this would impact the cell type deconvolution. Would the methods be able to like perform well over these different types of uh, data? Um, so that gets us into our RNA scope um, experimental design. So this was designed to be an orthogonal measurement of cell type proportions in these data sets. So what we have is for each of our um, tissue blocks, we have two slices. One was added to the star combination where we were measuring excitatory microglia and a combined oligodendrocyte OPC cell type. And the other was added to 
the circle combination, um, which was the nickname for our astrocyte endomural and intubatory combination of probes that'll allow us to measure those cell types. So then um, we analyzed these images with HALO, which did cell type calling for us and measured up the abundance of all of our cells. Um, so that is how we added like our cell type proportions measured out of RNA scope. Um, so the results of that analysis um, are pure. So um, here we're comparing our single nucleus RNA-seq proportion measurements out of uh, across those different samples. And then we're also looking at our RNA scope. So I want to point out that we see some of the same trends between our single nucleus and RNA scope, um, such as neurons being higher, so excitatory neurons typically being the highest expression. And then um, also abundant are the inhibitory and oligodendrocytes. Another thing that's common is we do see big ranges in cell types across our different samples. Part of that was we know that there's big differences in dissection in these DLPFC samples. Some of them have way more white matter and way more gray matter as you go through the different sections. Um, yeah, so that's kind of shown in the variation of the proportions shown in these compositional bar plots on the bottom here. Um, we also took a look at these just like spatially because in RNA scope, we do maintain the spatial data, which is cool. Um, so just checking out here, the, the yellow, which kind of looks green on these slides, um, is the excitatory neurons. And we see that those are nice bands of gray matter. And then likewise on the bottom, we get these nice bands. And then we see these glial cells be more concentrated in um, the, the white matter here. Kind of see those match up. So this is like the actual images. And then here's like the, the plots we made out of the, uh, I guess like the, the, the halo data. So like where we um, did all the segmentation and annotation. Um, so then if we compare the RNA scope versus the single nucleus RNA scope proportions sample to sample, so where we had those matched samples across the data set, um, you can see that sometimes for inhibitory, we got nice correlation, but for the other cell types, not so much. Um, so this is kind of why we think, we kind of think that single nucleus might not be the best measurement of cell type proportions. It can be biased by um, like the whole QC process of single nucleus RNA-seq. Um, so we think that the RNA scope might be a little bit more reliable, um, but they also to show that you can just get different proportions based off these different measurements. Um, all right, so backing up to look at this data set all together again. Um, so we just kind of showed how we have these three different data types and they're matched and how are they gonna plug into our deconvolution benchmark? So we have our six methods, that's what we're gonna test. Three of these are bulk, as are, are six different types of bulk RNA-seq as our input for the bulk data. We have our paired single nucleus data that's gonna be the reference data set. And then when we calculate the proportions, we're gonna compare them back to our RNA scope IF data set. That's the plan. Um, so then the outline for the rest of this and the, uh, the results that we got, I'm gonna first go over the results for the methods. Then we're gonna talk about um, selecting different marker genes for deconvolution. And then also what happens when you change some of these data set features. Okay, so first we were just like, evaluate our six methods. This is okay, uh, so the, the questions that we wanted to ask here is like, first of all, what is the most accurate decomposition so for our brain tissue? And then, um, and then two, like how does the different types of bulk RNA-seq impact this accuracy? So those different library types and RNA extraction that we're able to test in this data. Um, so yeah, the first step of this is just to run deconvolution on our uh, 110 bulk samples. Um, and so what you get is a cell type proportion estimate for each sample from each method for each cell type. So breaking this down, uh, if we look at just the range of ex the range of estimates we get for inhibitory neurons for just this one sample, you can see for DWS we get uh, 0.05 versus Bayes prism up to like 0.29. So we get a big range of different cell type proportions from these different methods. Um, and then if you add the other cell types in, so these are the same red bars on the bottom, you can see that there's even more variation like across the different cell types. And then remember, each of those tissues, each of those tissue blocks, we had six different bulk RNA-seq samples for. So again, this is one tissue block. And we have the six different types of bulk RNA-seq with thing. And then we have the estimates from across. And you can see within the different RNAs, 
RNA-seq library types in RNA extraction preps, we see like some wobble between the cell type estimates. So even with the different gene expression, we see some differences across the data sets. Some are more stable like HSP and BISC, but over here we get more, more wobble as, as we were calling it. Okay, and then we're really zooming out here. This is like a full range of RNA-seq proportions that we got. So that last slide we got, this we're looking at 27, 20 mid, that's the second column. You can see we have a lot of cell type proportions to dig into here. Um, so our first result is we wanted to compare those estimated proportions from our methods against our RNA scope proportions. So we just made these scatter plots um, and then we calculated Pearson correlation and root mean squared error. So for method to be good, we want high Pearson correlation and low error. So looking across <laughs> the different methods, we came up with that HSP and BISC had the highest correlation, 0.532 and 0.538, and then lo the lowest of root mean squared error. So these two methods were like our top two methods across um, some of these other ones didn't do so good. We have a DWS, we have like a zero correlation. So out of the gate, these are our top two uh, best methods. And then also if we can compare them to the single nucleus RNA-seq proportions, that pattern holds where HSP and BISC both still have the highest correlation, BISC having a correlation of 0.757. Um, so we see that pattern hold. And then what if we break it down by our library type RNA extraction? Like if we look back at these plots, the different point shapes are different extractions. You can see it's kind of a mix. How does that change things? Um, so I made this plot, which on the x-axis, we have our library type and RNA extraction. And then on the y-axis, we have our correlation. So these higher correlations are our better performers. And then the point size is our MSE. So we want small points. Um, and so this highest line for our poly A samples, we see is BISC. And then it kind of swaps when we change um, library types to ribozero zero gold, where HSP is just a little bit better. We also see that CyberSort is kind of in the mix too, especially for poly A. We do get larger RMSE values for CyberSort and it drops off for Rebus year gold. So it didn't quite make our top two, but it, it did have similar performance um, in some of these cases. Um, so yeah, what are the conclusions from that evaluation? So our most accurate method, HSP and BISC. And then is accuracy impacted by the type of bulk RNA seq? <coughs> yes. Um, we said that BISC is more accurate for poly A, HSP for Rebus zero gold, but it's pretty marginal difference. Um, and then also to note that most data at Liebert is rev zero gold. That might impact your choice in methods here. Um, and then RNA extraction, we said it had some impact. You can see like within the three, there's a little bit of wobble, but it was less of a consistent pattern and didn't seem to impact things as much as library type. Okay, so moving on to marker gene selection. Um, so the questions that we wanted to ask about marker genes is one, does selecting marker genes versus using just all the genes in a data set improve deconvolution? Um, and then number two, if, if that's the case, like if that's the case, how can we select good sets of marker genes? Um, so a lot of our thoughts around marker gene selection were motivated by Stephanie Hicks, who kind of like got us thinking that if we can select genes that have nice clean uh, differences between cell types, it'll really help us out with deconvolution. Um, so we wanted to filter for genes uh, first thing we would do, find genes that are expressed in both data sets. Um, and then we wanted to look for genes that are basically expressed in only one cell type. So if you made a heat map of that, it would be very just on or off. So like for cell type one, we'd only see expression from marker genes for cell type one. You get like a nice red diagonal. Um, and then, so we wanted to, to do that, we would have to figure out a test for, for specificity for each gene for each cell type. Um, and then we'd be able to observe these in this source of heat maps. Um, so a common uh, method that's used for marker gene selection is one versus all marker gene selection. Um, and this is like a method that's that often, uh, people often use scran five markers to do. Um, so what this is, is it's a differential expression test between your target cell type. So in this example, it's going to be our oligodendrocytes versus all of our other cell types. So everything else gets mashed into this other category. And then you do differential gene expression on all your genes for that cell type and you get your typical differential expression stats, p-value, log pool change. And then basically you select your genes with your highest log pool change as nice marker genes. However, we've kind of noticed that some of those marker genes can get kind of noisy. And we think that's because some uh, 
like within that other, right, there lies like a whole variation of gene expression in our other cell types. So if you break that out into a violin plot of the other cell types, you can see that there's still pretty high expression for MVP in our microglia and OTCs, which are kind of related cell types to oligodendrocytes. So it's not, you can almost find like the cleanest on and off genes. These genes can be useful for you know, other, other things, but we're looking for like really cell type specific expression, um, which would be more like FLOH1, where you see just everything else is off. So enter our method, which is mean ratio gene selection. And how we do that is we, um, we're looking for genes where there's a big difference between our target cell type and the second highest cell type in each gene. So what we do is we calculate the ratio of the mean expression of our target cell type, so the expression of MVP for oligos, divided by the mean expression for the highest non-target cell type, which would be microglia, and you get a ratio. And then the higher that ratio is, the bigger the difference there is between the first and second, and then everything else has to be low in second. Um, so you end, we were able to select really clean genes using, using this method. So for instance, um, the mean ratio for MVP is only 2.6, but for FLLH1, it's 21.6. So we think that this is a good way to select really distinct and specific genes for deconvolution. Um, we've also found that it's useful for other applications in examining our single cell data. Um, so I've implemented this uh, function, implemented this as a part of our decombo buddies package in a function called get mean ratio two. Um, so this is a strategy that we're excited to present in this paper. Um, so then how does mean ratio compare to one versus all, or I guess to one versus all? And what we found is that mean ratio just helps you kind of select a subset of genes that are also like going to be good um, one versus all genes. So if we compare mean ratio to the standard log pull change, which is often what people use to select these marker genes, we get what we call a hockey stick shape. So things that have high log pull change uh, sometimes have high mean ratios. So like it kind of pulls out a subset of those high log pull change genes. And then these are usually the genes that we're selecting as our top mean ratio genes. Um, so with that in mind, we wanted to test these from this mean ratio method against uh, both the one versus all genes. Um, so we're testing a couple different sets of marker genes in deconvolution. So the five different sets we tested were the full gene set, full set of common genes between our single nucleus and RNA-seq data, and then also the top 25 one versus all genes for each cell type, the top 25 mean ratio genes by each cell type, and then we also tried two other selection strategies for mean ratio over two, so just all genes for each cell type where the mean ratio is over two, and then uh, mean ratio MAD3, so looking for all genes with the mean ratio over one, taking the average and then three median deviations. So that's our most complicated selection strategy, and um, you know, gets kind of uh, some different sets of genes that we, need, so that we wanted to test. Okay, so luckily going on this slide, we'll walk through it. So the first result that we already looked at was our mean ratio top 25s. Um, so I guess, sorry, let me back up. Um, the columns here are different methods like before, but now on the different rows are different gene sets. And then I've circled in pink for each method, the top correlation and then in blue, the lowest root mean squared error. So I guess a big takeaway here is that uh, our method performance can really vary over which gene set they do the best on. However, um, we did find that BISC had the best correlation and its lowest RMFD using our mean ratio top 25, and mean ratio top 25 often had the lowest RMSD. We also saw, well, there's some good performances in here from, for instance, like CyberSort versus Full had like, uh, uh, like a 0.55, um, that was its highest. If you, oh, sorry. if you look, there's like a big spread with some of the library combos in here. So we kind of thought that that was interesting. It's like less reliable. So we kind of broke down that data into this plot. So here we're plotting the correlation of um, the, each library combo, uh, correlation versus RMSE. So again, we're looking for high correlation, low RMSE. So we're looking for things to end up in this corner. And then the different colors are our different marker sets. So we're looking for things that end up in, again, this corner by color. Um, basically what we saw for some of these poor performing metrics, like you get big spreads 
from the different marker sets. Specifically, music's really, really sensitive to marker set selection. Um, so even like its full was like its worst performing. So this, you know, it's kind of unpredictable. Um, but then up to HSP and BISC, we kind of saw this uh, purple be in the corner. We kind of thought like our mean ratio top 25 markers, like kind of best balanced correlation with uh, RMSE. Um, for instance, like HSP like has pretty high correlation for most of these with the full data set, but can really fall off with, um, uh, can kind of fall off with error and it's inconsistent between library combinations, whereas the, uh, they looked a little better for the mean ratio top 25. So, you know, you could like think about what marker set to use here, but we thought that those were nicely balanced. And so we recommend using our mean ratio top 25 in these methods. Okay. So to summarize that section, um, does selecting marker Gs improve deconvolution? It depends on the method. Um, and then HSP was more sensitive to BISC and the canon marker selection. BISC is pretty solid. We got almost all the same results with BISC. Um, and then how to best select good sets of marker genes for marker genes. Um, we like the mean ratio top 25 method. We think it produces really nice uh, distinct gene sets. Um, it's also useful for other things. And we saw it behave nicely in BISC and HSP. All right, so moving on to our last section, which is um, using other data sets and considering other challenges in deconvolution. So what other factors can impact method performance? And namely like what features of single nucleus RNA-seq data sets can like impact the accuracy of deconvolution? So the three things we wanted to test here were what happens when you change the number of donors? Um, what about donor diversity if you have a case control data set? Um, and then also, uh, does the existing proportion of cell types impact these methods? Um, so to do this, we changed out our input data set. So we were using our paired single nucleus RNA-seq data, but instead we're gonna try our trans Maynard et al. neuron, the LPFC data set, um, which is three donors. And then we're also gonna try the Matthews et al. Nature 2019, which is 48 donors, half of which have an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. So here we're adding, we're kind of, we have a diversity and we have a, a range of number of donors. And we're also adding uh, like a diverse donor set with that um, Matthews data. Um, and then to point out that the trend data is quite a bit smaller than our other data sets. We have 57,000 nuclei here, around 7,000 nuclei in the Matthews data set and the trend data is much smaller. We also kind of have like a more diverse, you know, we see some range in the proportions uh, in this as well from these data sets. Okay, so what we did is we ran just HSP and BISC on the Tran and Matthews data, and we took a look at the same metrics we've been examining, correlation and RMSE. And then I have a, this line plot kind of summarizes these across our different data sets, um, where again, color is method, and then our input data set is the different line types, where the solid is the paired, which we've seen before, but then Tran is the dotted line, and Matthews is the dashed line. So what I wanna point your attention to is that for BISC, with the TRAN, the small number of donor data sets, the correlation really falls off across our different data types. Everything else is pretty much grouped up here. We see similar, um, similar performance, but uh, BISC really falls off. And we kind of expected this because even within the BISC paper, they recommend not using that method with less than four donors, which can be a real weakness of that method is like, you know, that might be what you have on single nucleus. So that, that is like something to consider. Uh, whereas uh, HSP did well in the small data set. So that's a contrast. But then also pointing out that both of those methods did fine, um, if not even better, on the uh, Matthews data set, which had the introduction of cases. Um, now, this was only Alzheimer's disorder. What might happen with other case, cases, other, uh, you know, other diseases, we're not sure, but at least here it seemed, they seemed pretty stable. Um, so that was promising. And then another thing we wanted to test um, was what happens when you change cell type proportions? Do these methods, can these methods see through uh, skewed cell type proportions in the input? So this was done with the help of Nick Eagles. So what we did is we took our paired data set and we subset it down to the number of nuclei from our lowest cell types, which are marker glia. Um, so we subset everything down to 1600 cells per cell type, big jump. And we did that 1000 times. So we would avoid sampling bias. Um, and you can see like when you have that subset proportion, nice even bars on our proportion bar plot. Um, and then we ran that BISC and HSP each 1,000 times with all the different inputs. And what we got 
um, here looking at the mean estimated proportions, you can see that this kind of mirrors that even cell type proportion across all of our different samples, whereas HSP looks more similar to what we saw before with higher neurons, lower glia. Um, and then looking at the, the correlation and or looking at our correlation plots to RNA scope, um, you can see that this really falls off correlation wise, get a negative 0.018 not good, everything's kind of flat because it's mirroring that even cell type proportions versus HSP is able to keep like a nice, you know, drops to like 0.4 versus 0.5, but it's still doing pretty good on the, the, the simulated data. Uh, so what other factors can impact our performance? Number of donors, uh, this does not do well on low number of donor data sets. Um, donor diversity, um, both methods were able to handle the inclusion of Alzheimer's disorder without losing accuracy, which was nice. HSP even did better, not sure why. Um, and then existing proportions of cell types, we know BISC is pretty biased to the input. So if, you, if your uh, input is like skewed for whatever reason, such as like nuance sorting, BISC is gonna kind of reflect that in the output. So that's also like another issue with BISC. Um, all right, so to back up and summarize all of that, um, we found that HSP and BISC were our top performing methods. HSP E did marginally better for our ribo zero gold type samples. Um, marker genes, uh, marker genes can really impact the, uh, can impact method uh, accuracy. Um, we think that mean ratio is an effective way to find um, nice specific cell type marker genes. Um, and then we thought mean ratio top 25 improved the accuracy of HSP and BISC. Um, and then data set features to consider. Um, that BISC is sensitive to low donors and input cell type proportions. Um, all right, so then backing up to the beginning where we read other benchmarks and we weren't sure about like how to conclude. Um, so then adding our own, our own benchmark to the list. Um, so here we use our RNA scope to, RNA scope to evaluate deconvolution in the brain. And we kind of agreed with this diadol benchmark, which was also done in the brain using immunohistochemistry. chemistry. And what we found is that like um, HSP and BISC were both like the top performing methods. So we finally found, we're, we're finding a consensus there where these two methods seem to do well in brain data. So that was a nice way to support our conclusions as well. Um, so this work and much more side explorations into the fun world of deconvolution are now in our benchmark preprint. Um, so if you want to learn more, just check that out. Um, and then all of this work has been part of our larger deconvolution project which involves a number of people. Um, so uh, another paper that was involved with this was the Benchmark Challenges paper. Um, so this was from Sean, uh, Sean Maiden, um, the postdoc was Stephanie Hicks, and then also Christy Minner was involved with this. But this basically was kind of a review paper of all of the challenges um, involved in deconvolution and kind of outlined the need for an orthogonal data set such as this. Um, and also like uh, maybe another challenge is considering cell size, which was, a, was kind of the other uh, road that Sean took and um, Sean explored considering cell, cell size and deconvolution in his work in the loop preprint, which is basically um, uh, a bioconductor package that kind of standardizes uh, deconvolution and you're able to use um, some of the different methods in one pipeline and you're also able to add cell scale factors, which can improve performance of some of these methods. Um, but well, that is its own set of work here. Um, so definitely um, also like very connected papers to this benchmark and that you should check out. Um, and then some resources that we have and also some new ones coming soon. Um, I'm working on developing further our deconvo buddies package. Um, so it's a bar, an R bioconductor package that has the tools for marker finding from that mean ratio tool and also make plotting functions that are useful for um, deconvolution such as plotting marker gene expression. Um, and it also has access to the paired data set that we've presented here. So you can download the bulk RNA-seq data set, the single nucleus RNA-seq data set, and then also the RNA scope proportions. So all of that's available if, uh, for people who might wanna do further work with these data sets. Um, and then we also have, also on the Do Combo Buddies website, we have a code tutorial, and then we also have video tutorial, video tutorial about how to do deconvolution. And then there's going to be an updated version of this um, at our stats club in a couple weeks. So I'm presenting the update of this work on May 3rd. Um, yeah, so with that, I'm all done. And I'd like to acknowledge some all the people that helped 
to complete this project. Um, so Leo, Nick, and then Diana, who helped with uh, some of the computational stuff. And then Kristen Maynard and her team who did a lot of great web bench work here. So saying hello, Kelsey and Sophia, and then also Stephanie and Sean who advised and helped guide this project. Um, so with that, I'm all done. Um, thanks for your attention. Does anybody have any 